named our whole operation AM760, San Diego Sports 760. You can find us via the free iHeartRadio app. It's number one for podcasting. Listen wherever, whenever, however you'd like. Some of you might be making your way out to some Cactus League spring training action over the next couple of weeks. You can always listen to this show and other shows via the free iHeartRadio app. Now, you can do that live. You can stream us through your smart speaker, Siri, Alexa, Bluetooth, all via the free iHeartRadio app. You can also listen on demand. You can subscribe to the show, listen a little later on. We're going to have some guests today from the back patio of the Peoria Sports Complex. You might want to go back and listen to them a little later. Maybe you're called into a meeting, got to pick the kids up from school. The iHeartRadio app allows you to do just that. SportsSD.com, that is our website. There is a Listen Live link. We have three hours today. We're going to spend the majority of our day talking about the San Diego Padres. Padres spring training, a little bit of news coming from Padres spring training earlier today. We'll get get to Shilty, since I feel like he's very fond of the nickname business. Shilty, we'll hear from him in a little bit, what he had to say about the alignment of the infield. We're going to preview San Diego State and New Mexico tonight at Viejas Arena. Uh, Elimination kind of feel to it in the Mountain West Conference for the regular season title. A little bit of an elimination feel to it, but they're all back in action. If you're on social media, you've probably been watching videos and seeing clips, seeing photos of what it is that's happening at the Peoria Sports Complex. That's where the Padres hold their spring training. It has always been a a spot where we've had a lot of fun, where we've learned and met a lot of interesting people. And hopefully that is going to be the case again this year. We're going to start our show with the guest right out of the shoot because we know how busy these guys are. They have busy schedules. They're running around from one field to the next field, especially if you're new to the organization. You're learning about coaches. You're learning about teammates. You're learning an entirely new system. That is certainly the case for Michael King. Michael King was part of the Soto trade, the Juan Soto trade. Michael King, Drew Thorpe, uh, Johnny Brito, uh, Vasquez, Kyle Higashioka. So we're going to talk to him coming up a little later on, but our first opportunity to say hello to Michael King. Lots of expectations. Everybody's loving what they're hearing from Michael King. And he joins us on the back patio of the Peoria Sports Complex. Michael, this is Darren Smith back in San Diego. Thanks so much. Oh, of course. Yeah, thank you for having me. How are you? Good. You can hear uh, us okay? Yes. Can you hear me? I got you, pal. How's right, it going? Cool. Oh, it's great. I uh, It's my first time in Arizona, so I'm uh, enjoying the dry weather. I would imagine. I was going to ask, what is this adjustment like? You spent your entire entire professional career this time of the year, you've been in the state of Florida, right? So this is your first opportunity, not just in the Cactus League, but in Arizona overall. What are your impressions, not just of the organization, but the new settings? Yeah, no, nah, it's uh, uh, an adjustment in weather because it's freezing when I get in my car in the morning. But then <laughs> when I come out here, I'm in short sleeves and I'm sweating. So I got to kind of adjust my my wardrobe. But uh, no, nah, I mean, it's great. I got to blow into my hand a little bit to get a little bit more moisture because it's so dry for the grip of the ball. But uh, besides that, it's same old baseball, you know? Same old baseball. Well, a little different, like you said. Sometimes that air, sometimes you know, you'll, you'll, you'll learn. I'm sure people will tell you about it as well. Sometimes those results there, they they start to, to misrepresent just a little bit in spring training, both offensively and defensively, Michael. But I think the great thing, too, is somebody who's covered the Grapefruit League in the past, like this is just a million times better to each their own. But, you know, you don't have to take road trips, right? You don't have to drive up and down the state of Florida. I think you're really going to like it. And I'm sure that you've had a lot of people telling you just that. Oh yeah, everybody says you're you're gonna absolutely love it out there. And even uh, before I left, Aaron Boone said that towards the end of his career, all he wanted to do was sign with the team that had an Arizona spring training because he wanted to have a spring training in Arizona. So uh, I'm definitely enjoying my time right now, and uh, I'm excited for for games to get going. Well, I would imagine as well. What's it like getting used to a new organization? It's definitely an adjustment. Um, obviously, you come in and you're almost the quiet kid because you don't know anybody, you have no friends. So I was actually happy that I had a couple guys come over with the Yankees. Um, and then we also signed Wandy Peralta, Tyler Wade I used to play with. So there are a couple guys that are familiar faces for me. But um, I, I got I to gotta learn my footing. I got to I still don't know anybody's name. So I, I feel bad that I keep introducing myself to people I've already introduced myself to. Um, but once we get the, the groundwork going, it, it, it'll be a lot easier. Right. And and aside from learning everybody's names, it's a good thing people have names on the back of their jerseys, right? Although I suspect you're not just talking about teammates, Michael. Yep, uh, yep. What, what what just like routine wise? Uh, I mean, what what like a new organization, a new way of doing thing, a new voice, a new manager, a new pitching coach, strength and conditioning, right? The list goes on and on and on. Like, 
seems like it's pretty overwhelming. I, I would imagine they're not expecting you to know all of this stuff here on February 16th, but like, do you have to sort of just clean the slate and start all over again from everything that you knew in professional baseball? No, not really. Um, and I'm actually super grateful for that. Uh, I had a long conversation with Ruben, multiple conversations with Ruben this, this off season, um, just about my routine and uh, having that communication allowed me to come in with a much better relationship with him. And he understands my routine. He understands how I go about my business. So uh, it made it a lot easier of a transition, but then also coming in with the training staff and the, and the strength coaches, obviously they do things a little bit differently, but it's more of, they know that I got to the level that I'm at um, with the routine that I had and they don't want to change anything, but they're suggesting, Hey, I can give you this. And if it works for your routine, then add it to the routine. If not, you don't like it, then take it away. So they're actually been really understanding of me. Um, so Jay, the strength coach and, and really I've been talking to Mark a bunch in the, in the training room, just about different um, routines, post throwing or in between throwing um, that I, I, I've loved. And I, I've already adapted my, my routine a little bit to, to this. Interesting, because sometimes you hear about players that go to new organizations and, and maybe not a complete teardown, but it's like, no, no, this is the way we do things around here. That's interesting to hear. Michael King is joining us from the back patio of the Peoria Sports Complex. This has been a pretty eventful offseason, wouldn't you say? Uh, you got traded from the organization that you were primarily associated with to a new organization. You got married. You're relocating spring training for the first time in Arizona. You're looking for a place to live in Southern California. How, how is it just going? How is life with all of the change for Michael King? It's, it's, it's great. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I found out that I got traded. I think it was 10 days before I got married. Um, so that threw a little, a little wrinkle in my off season, but um, my, my wife, Sheila was awesome about it. And we still had a blast at the wedding. Um, and then, yeah, we had to change where we were going to live. We had to figure out our spring training housing. We had to figure out our season housing. So um, we went through a little adjustment period, but um, after that, it was just really thinking about the opportunity that, that we both have, um, even just for our for our marriage. It's, it's awesome to then go all the way across the country and I'm just stuck with her and we're going to really learn a lot about each other and, and uh, mold our relationship to, uh, to the best that it possibly can be. So I'm uh, really excited, not just for the Padres opportunity, but also uh, with, with my my new wife. I would love to hear some details, if you wouldn't mind, just a couple of the conversations. Number one, Michael, would be the conversation where you find out you're getting traded. Does that come from the Yankees? Does it come from your agent? Do you read it on Twitter? Uh, how do you find out that you've you've been traded from the Yankees to the Padres? Mine actually was my agent. Um, I think that it's because it was Juan Soto, it was a really, and because it was New York, it was a really hard thing for both teams to kind of keep secret. Um and so I, there was a ton of, we lost covered. there for a quick second. Oh, yeah, if you wouldn't sorry. mind just, yeah. How did you find out that you got traded? Um, yeah. So I think it was really hard for the media not to be all over uh, one, a Juan Soto trade, but also, also to New York. Um, and that, that media coverage is, is insane. So I found out from my agent who actually found out from Joel Sherman um, because Joel Sherman got called from somebody said like, get a suit on it's 10 PM and uh, on the East coast. And he's like, yeah, get a suit on. You're about to come on MLB network to talk about something big with the Yankees. And uh, so my agent kind of knew what, that was, what was happening there. And as I was watching MLB network, um, I see my phone light up with a, a call from Brian Cashman. And that's when I knew it was fully official. Um, and it was a quick call, just like a thank you for everything you've done for our organization and wish you best of luck. Um, and then I started getting the, the flood of texts and calls from, teammates, coaches, friends, whoever. Um, but it was a, it was an eventful night. I didn't get much sleep that night. I would imagine. And then what is the conversation with you and then your fiance, right? Your fiance at the time, the chronology is you get traded, then you get married 10 days later. Then what's that conversation like? Yeah, we, uh, she's awesome because she then just flipped the switch to, to baseball mode for a little bit there and allowed us to really focus on baseball instead of our marriage, um, or our, our upcoming wedding. Um, which was great of her. And I uh, fully respect her because we took a good two, three days. That was whatever the week leading up to our wedding where we really had to focus on baseball. And we found housing out in uh, in Arizona. We found housing in San Diego. I had so many different phone calls with other people. So um, she was able to, to be very, um, I don't know, helpful to me. And then we just totally switched on the, on the wedding mode and, and had an absolute blast. I would love that. Did anything have to change with the wedding? Like, was there any sort of Yankee themed uh, party no. favors, anything along those lines? Or, or like, was that not something that you were going to do anyway? No, no. Um, I definitely had a ton of Yankee teammates that came to the to the wedding. Mm -hmm. And obviously I wouldn't have changed that anyways. They're, they're going to be friends for life, the, the, those that came. So 
um, it was it was different uh, because it was a New York wedding, so we just called it our send off. So it, it was a it was a, a fun little trip. Uh, Michael King is joining us. Michael, uh, obviously, I, I think most people just feel like it's Darvish, Musgrove, Musgrove, Darvish, Michael King slotted in third. Uh, you've had an interesting career. I think people are well aware of who you are and you know how your career has gone. Relief pitcher, starting pitcher, lots of success. Uh, most recent success there in in the latter role as well. Um, have you always looked in the mirror and saw yourself as a starter? You know, or is this something now like? Hey, new opportunity, new organization. Maybe they see it a little bit differently. You know what it is that they they really favored about you, or or was this always the case? Is, did you always look in the mirror and say, "Hey, listen, this relieving thing is good. I'll do it. Teamwork, team guy." But you know, eventually, you know, I want to be a starter in the big leagues. I definitely always wanted to be a starter. Um, I felt like I had the demeanor for it, um, and I was able to get through the minor league system with the stuff that I had. But then, once I got up to the big leagues, I got exposed because all I really had was a sinker. Um, didn't have the forcing that I have, didn't have a slider at all. It was a really bad slider that I had. Um, and then I had a command of a changeup, but it still wasn't a great changeup. And I think that I got exposed as a starter um, when I first got called up and then um, moved to the bullpen and really had to fine tune my stuff. And as soon as I was able to develop my arsenal, um, I was begging to, to get back in that rotation. And it's a tough rotation to crack over there. Um, and I guess, unfortunately for the Yankees, but fortunately for me, we had some injuries that opened up the door. And uh, and I, I was knocking on Boone's door the whole time, a asking for it. And I was really grateful that he gave me that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, there's no real shame, right? Like, there used to be an era of baseball where if, you you know, most most pitchers were starters at one point, And, you know, it's like, yeah, it's not really going to work, so let's move this guy into the bullpen. You know, it, it, there's no real shame in that anymore, right? Like, bullpen guys make a lot of money. Guys are drafted out of college as closers, as relievers. So, you know, it's it's completely changed. But you never, like, you never settled in and said, "All right, I, I mean, I guess this is what it is. I guess I'm just a relief pitcher in, in Major League Baseball. That's how everybody sees me." Yeah, I, my role was also weird over there because um, I would flip a lineup. I, I'd go three plus innings at, mm -hmm. at a given time, and I loved it because it was always high leverage. It wasn't like that the mop up duty that I feel like some people will be kind of given that tag. Um, but I was able to get three inning saves that were actual like one run ball games um and I, I felt like i gained the trust of boone to to lead me out there for nine plus hitters um i felt like i was able to really be able to work to lefties and righties um but the the main thing was actually which is funny it was Corey kluber Corey kluber helped me develop my it was the kluber ball that now i think everybody's coining as the sweeper um and i know he was a, an anomaly when he first had it when he first came up and won those cy youngs um but when he taught me that in the middle of 21 that's when i felt like my arsenal really took shape um, and then I was able to fine tune it in 22, unfortunately had the injury and then, uh, and was able to get the opportunity in 23. So lastly, you know, when you, you're in the Yankees organization, you know, the Yankees are, are truly one of those sports franchises that year in, year out does live by the, you know, the world series or, you know, everything's a failure, uh, philosophy, right. Whether that's right or wrong. I, you know, I've, I've been around it a little bit, Michael, in my life. And, and I, I certainly grew up around it and I, I understand the way a lot of people are wired around that organization. Is there anything different? I know you just got here, but is there anything you know that you've noticed in terms of expectations inside of the Padre Clubhouse early on? I mean, we're not even to the full squad yet, but is there you know is there anything different in terms of expectations that you've noticed about expectations in 2024? People might look on the surface and go, "Well, they traded away Juan Soto, and Blake Snell's not going to be here, and Josh Hader signing with the Houston Astros." So you know, clearly you know, they're talking about a, a Double A player potentially playing the outfield. You tell us internally, uh, do you sense that that there are high expectations with the Padres for 2024? 100%. And I also think that that's really driven from the players. Um, and we we felt the pressure in New York because that's just how it was. And you come over to the Padres, and that's why I'm, I'm very thankful I got traded to a team that's still competing because you look in the locker room, and there's not just the, the money that was spent a couple off seasons ago, but the talent that's in the locker room and guys that – you're going to need to have production from your younger guys. And we might have a little bit more of that influence throughout the year this year, but the main core group of guys that are here, that are the uber talented guys that should be putting up 40 bombs or giving us 20 wins. It could be a really special season. So I see that the, the, ter the determination from our current players that are on the roster still give me the, the world series or bust mentality. Um, and I hope to add to that. I mean, and a guy like Joe Musgrove, I would think, uh, tell Bingo. us what kind of tone setter he is early on for you. Again, I know you're just getting to know everybody and their numbers and everybody's names, but but mm -hmm. it certainly has always seemed to me like like Musgrove, at least amongst the pitchers and potentially amongst the position players as well, 
is a is a tone setter in the clubhouse. What's it What's it like? Just what's What's it been like being received by him? Yeah, he uh, he's awesome because he's a guy that one treats everybody else like they're the ten year veteran, um, but also is the guy that's in there that's going to outwork the the rookie that's really trying to break camp. So it's fun to have a guy like that that isn't just super talented and is just going off of his own um, his own skill. He's actually fine tuning it, and not only that, he's trying to help all the younger guys else younger guys out to then help the team because he knows that we need it. Um, so it's it's great to basically have two aces um, and my locker is right next to Darvish's too. So I've been talking to him a bunch and, and I mean, it's, it's going to be really fun to not only watch them throughout the year, do their business, but also then learn from them and how they've had all the success uh, throughout their careers. All right. Well, Hey, good to chat with you. Now these are the spring training caps. I, we're also streaming this for people who, who are thinking that they're just listening on radio. This might be a weird question. Those are the the spring training caps here. They're sort of like yellow goldish. I think so. Yeah. I don't Boy, know you can see the 24, 24 logo there. So yeah, I, I, it's a little flashy for me, but I like it. You know, I got I gotta <laughs> break it out a little bit. I like it too. I mean, you know, we're we're always going to know where Padre players are anytime they're out there on the baseball diamond. <laughs> exactly. For sure. If you guys wander off into a into a field somewhere, it won't be too hard to find anybody <laughs> who's drifted off from the Padres. Michael, congrats on everything that you've had going on this off season. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us, and I hope we get a chance to do it again. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, you got it, Michael King. Everybody, starting pitcher now with the San Diego Padres who, uh, again, according to everybody who has talked about this trade, has said this is you know certainly one of the players who the Padres are going to be relying on early, regularly throughout the season. And, you know, that that whole conversation about being a relief pitcher, starting pitcher, et cetera, you know, good on, on Michael to say, hey, listen, I sort of really wasn't qualified to do that sort of stuff. You know, that's a position where you got to have multiple pitches. Starters, relievers, you know, you, you can get by with one or two. You, you, you can't really get by with one or two when it comes to being a starter. I mean, most can't, most mortal pitchers can't. Um, there are rare exceptions every once in a while, right? That was a conversation we used to have about the Nelson Lamette. Can he just get by with two pitchers, two pitches as a starting pitcher? You know, we you know, unfortunately uh, didn't never get to realize, you know, what he could be long-term in his career, but pretty eventful to go from engagement Finding out Joel Sherman calls your agent. Joel Sherman's a reporter with MLB Network and maybe one of the New York Post or the Athletic, something. One of those MLB insider types, and he's the one that breaks the news. You know, that's that's the world you live in now. Oftentimes, people go, I can't believe a player found out on Twitter. These things happen so quickly, sometimes you can't even get your general manager to be the person who's letting the player or the player's agent know exactly what it is. So Darvish or Musgrove, Musgrove or Darvish, into Michael King there in the three spot. I don't know what this question's about on the text line, 70470, first word of the text team. Ask King if he's still doing the King walk up from his sister. I I just, it felt like something that I could ask and I could completely sabotage my own interview. So forgive me. I'll ask Marty to ask if, if that's something off the air. But uh, a little bit of news out there. Dennis Lynn is going to join us coming up a little later on. You know, this is one of those, uh, the Padres have, have created a solution to a problem that probably didn't exist, but the Padres have said that Hassan Kim is going to be the starting shortstop in 2024, and Xander Bogarts is going to be the starting second baseman in 2024. I'm guessing most people are probably aware that that is the news of the day so far. Again, I, I don't view this as one of those problems that had to be addressed. It's not like Xander was a bad shortstop. Kim was a very good fielder. Kim won a gold glove. He is younger and naturally a shortstop. Again, it's it's sort of a solution to a problem that didn't seem like it was too pressing. But there are layers to it, right? There are layers to this that I think are, are fair to speculate about, including what does this mean for Hassan Kim's future? I don't think you're going to announce a move like this on February 16th if there's any chance at all that you're trading Hassan Kim between now and the start of the season. So whatever speculation and however unlikely it seemed for you, for some, you can you can most likely put that to rest. Does that mean that you're inclined to sign him? Is this an effort to say, we know he really prefers to play short? Not that he's ever said it. He's always been very team-oriented. But he probably prefers to play short. So maybe this is a good faith effort for us to say, hey, like this is how we view you in the future. If for whatever reason 
we offer you money and somebody else offers you a little bit more money and it comes down to, you know, putting everything down pros and cons of the situation. Well, you know, now you get to play your preferred position, presuming of course, this is his preferred position. What does this mean? I always thought now I, I kind of, I don't want to take any partial credit for this. I, I know there's a lot of ego in this business. Where everybody's like, ah, I've been telling you, I, I do think I thought the way the Padres would start the season would be, Manny, maybe not physically ready to play third, Kim at third, Xander short, and then you just kind of move everybody one position to the right, right? You just kind of move Kim the short and you say, well, we need a little bit more range with Manny in the shoulder because we don't want him diving or the elbow. And we move Xander, then you take the opportunity. But this makes more sense, doesn't it? I mean, it makes more sense to get Xander fully on board before the season starts while you're there to do what? To practice. This is the whole point. You probably wouldn't want to do that in April. So, you know, I just sort of thought through that on the air one day, thinking through, well, what is it going to look like? And I thought I thought the story would be at some point you're moving Xander Bogarts to second base. I thought that was something perhaps you would do in season. But now, again, knowing what we know now, it, I guess that this makes a ton more sense just to say, hey, Xander, uh, listen, this is the, this is. This is what we feel like is in the best interest of the squad. Now, you still, this still means, this also means something for first base. This means Jake Cronenworth is your first baseman. That is something that Mike Schilt has said. Remember when Kevin Acey had the Q&A with Mike Schilt a couple of weeks back? Apparently, there's some sort of budding relationship here with Acey and Mike Schilt. You can hear it in some of these press conferences. We'll play it coming up in a little bit. But... When he asked about Cronenworth, Schilt was pretty clear that Cronenworth had done some pretty good things at first base. When he was asked about Xander Bogarts, Schilt's response was, that's a good question. So, you know, to me, that was, you know, we 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 sort of sensed something was happening. Again, I wasn't sure it would be this. I wasn't sure how they were going to do it. It just seemed that they were going to do it. And now we have the answer. Now we have the answer. You'll hear it coming up in a bit. But Mike Schilt went down to Aruba, had the conversation with Xander Bogarts, and Xander reluctantly or willingly or who knows, nobody was there except for those two, said, okay, well, let's let's move forward then with the plan. I'll go play second base. So he got his mind ready for second base in the offseason. Who knows if Xander was doing anything down in Aruba on his own with the trainer, what have you. But today now there's all sorts of footage of Xander Bogarts taking some ground balls, learning a little bit about the footwork. Remember, this is a guy that's played exclusively on the right side, left side of the infield. So it is. It's a bit of an adjustment, but I think Xander's pretty good. He wasn't bad. Nobody said Xander Bogarts was bad at shortstop last year. I don't know that this is the most pressing thing that the Padres had to address, but they addressed it, and they addressed it early. And now you're moving forward with Hassan Kim as your shortstop and Xander Bogarts as your second baseman. Back after this.
This update is presented by Jackson Hewitt. It does matter who does your taxes. Aztecs back in action tonight. It's a big one. They're taking on New Mexico at home. It's a revenge game for the Scarlet and Black, whose last home loss came to New Mexico last January. It was an 88-70 trouncing for the Lobos in 2023. Great game coverage gets started at 6. Tip of is at 7. All the action on San Diego Sports 760. History in Iowa City last night. Caitlin Clark becomes the NCAA's all-time scorer in women's hoops, passing Kelsey Plum's 3,527 career points. Clark also set a new single-game scoring high with 49 points. She also had 13 rebounds and 5 assists. And, of course, the big Padres new Xander Bogarts moves to second and ha Song Kim back at shortstop. Why are people saying hoo to Jackson Hewitt? When you switch to Jackson Hewitt, they'll beat any of the taxes that you paid last year even if you filed online, proof of prior year payment required when filing new clients only at participating locations through April 7th. Terms at jacksonhewitt.com. With you to 3 o'clock, John and Jim coming up here in a little bit. You can text us, 70470, first word of the text, team, T-E-A-M. Interesting, we have both sides of the announcement from earlier today that Xander Bogarts is going to be the team starting second baseman. Hassan Kim will be the team starting shortstop. 619 says, this is a terrible move. Hassan at short is great. Cronenworth is above average. I don't understand the Bogarts trade. I don't know. Trade signing, I guess. Signing is probably what this person was referring to. I feel like it was a fan move by Peter before he passed, and it contains a contract that's a team killer. We need to bring in a DH to play first. That's from a 619 number. And then just a couple of minutes earlier, an 858 number says, hey, Darren, I love the move to second for Xander. He automatically becomes a top five offensive second baseman, and that should take some wear and tear off his body. Props to Schilt and Bogarts for doing what's best for the team, something that was missing last year. There is a theme developing, and I'm going to just say early on, if your first instinct is to say, this is such a credit to Mike Schilt, this is something that should have been done last year with Bob Melvin, you're kind of crazy and you're rewriting history. You weren't given that option last year because they had an introductory press conference where Xander Bogarts, this is the one that Jim Russell interrupted, where he was asked specifically about, you do know that there's Hassan Kim here and there's Fernando Tatis Jr. here. Has the team negotiated with you about playing a position other than short? He looked at the person who asked the question like the person had three heads. He's like, what? No. Almost dumbfounded said, I was brought in here and told specifically that I was being brought in here to be a shortstop. That wasn't on the table last year. That required a full season. That required an off season. That required a conversation. It is so unfair and it's just so typical for people to to say, and credit to Schilt for having the conversation, for being the one that either said, I'm going to go to Aruba to have this conversation Or, hey, Mike, you're the one that has to have this conversation because he probably doesn't need to hear it from Preller. Credit to the person who delivered the message. But still, it wasn't a conversation that you were capable of having last year. Now, I will say also, I continue to hear Joe Musgrove again today say something to the effect, and this is how you know for everybody that wants to say that Juan Soto was a headache or that Blake Snell was a headache or that... Whoever who's not here was a headache last year. Bob Melvin was a headache, right? Josh Hader was a headache. He was a bit of a diva. And there were guys that certainly were prioritizing things perhaps other than the team. But I continue to hear Musgrove say, what we have to do is put our egos off to the side. Not everything's going to be better addition by subtraction. So it still makes me believe that there is a bit of accountability expected internally inside of the clubhouse from the Padres organization. Because I don't think Musgrove says what he says several times now, according to my count, in several different settings, talking about dudes putting their egos off to the side. 
We got to make sure that we put our egos off to the side. We got to make sure that we're better at coming together as a team. If he feels like all of those problems went away because you traded away a player who some of you think is a prima donna because they allowed a couple of players to walk away in free agency, one of whom won a Cy Young Award, who was pretty picky and choosy about how he wanted to be used, and his agent was pretty picky and choosy, and we know all we need to know now about the closer. But Musgrove continues to say this, and maybe this is a great example of somebody going, I will put the team first. I would rather play short, but I will put the team first, and I will play second base. Now, Mike Schilt spoke earlier today, and Mike Schilt made this announcement. It was very interesting how this all shook out, that Xander Bogarts was in camp today, and one of the very first questions from Kevin Acey was about Xander Bogarts and how he fits in in 2024. Here's the way it sounded from the Peoria Sports Complex. All right, so that was Bob Melvin a little bit earlier today. 360, it seems like players in the organization overall are much more, huh? Uh, Bob Melvin, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I was reading this text. That was Mike Schilt from earlier today. Schilty. I feel like we need some sort of uh, sounder every time Mike Schilt uses a, a nickname. Way to go, Ace. You're on it as always. Very interesting commentary. <laughs> Um, three, six, zero seems like players in the org overall are much more cohesive with show. I mean, how does anybody know such a thing? Like the full squad hasn't even shown up yet. Uh, much more cohesive with Schilt than Melvin of whom you seem to be, seem to be so defensive. Why the dude fantasized about managing the team in the other dugout. He checked out. We're so much better off. I do agree. There came a point where he did check out where I think he knew that this was not going to continue. However, I, I think it's really sort of short-sighted just to say, well, you know, this is something that was created exclusively by Bob Melvin. And, you know, I could read some of what it is that Kevin Acey wrote, and I will in a little bit, because, you know, certainly the thought of, of, well, everything's better now because there's alignment. Well, we've had alignment in this organization before, right? His name was Jace Tingler. So there was a lot of alignment in this organization in the past. I just think that we're, we're being very convenient. Uh, we're being, not we, not everybody, but I think we're forgetting this was a problem between two people. This was a problem between two people. This wasn't the problem exclusively because of one person. And I, I think now we're sort of saying what I hear and what I'm reading, and perhaps I'm reading too much into some of what it is that's being written. When AC writes, Preller subsequently found a manager who considers alignment a guiding principle. What that suggests to me is Bob Melvin didn't consider alignment to be a guiding principle as if we're going to pin this 100% on Bob when the two of them couldn't get along and the two of them each played a role in taking down the 2023 Padres. That's my point. My point is anybody who thinks that this was 100% the fault of the manager who's no longer here is either hearing what they want to hear or they're being short-sighted or they're rewriting history. There's been plenty written and said about A.J. Preller and his managerial style in the past. It applies. It's applied then. It's applied with different managers long before Bob Melvin. Don't care about Bob. Didn't get to know Bob at all. But we're, we're sort of rewriting history if we're just going to pin this on one person, that everything that went wrong was the fault of one person when we're talking about alignment. 
It's up to the general manager to figure out how the alignment works in the organization. If it were Bob Melvin who were managing today and A.J. Preller was the one that left the organization because he got fired, which certainly was something a lot of people were screaming for at the end of last season, would we be all sitting here today talking about how rotten A.J. Preller was and how perfectly aligned a new general manager was with Bob Melvin? I suspect we would. That's my point. All right, coming up, we're going to get to the J-Riff call of the day. Dennis Lynn will join us top of the hour from the back patio of the Peoria Sports Complex at San Diego Sports 760.
Welcome to iHeart Spotlight. It's the go-to place in the iHeart app that keeps you up to date with the latest music, podcasts, and more. Just open the iHeart app, explore a collection of content that you can't get anywhere else, like new music for you, the exclusive NFL podcast slate. It's all within the free iHeart app. The award-winning Move the Sticks podcast is in there inside of the free iHeart app. Just listen now. Yeah, again, I think you have to sort of see what's happening here. Oh, wow, Kevin, what a great question. Lucky guess, I suppose. You just knew to ask where Xander Bogarts was going to play today. Ace man, you're on it as always. Some great teamwork on display out there in Peoria today. Again, it just is, it's amusing. I hope so. I like Mike Schilt. I enjoyed speaking with him. I suspect he's going to have a much better relationship with people in our business than his predecessor who didn't really care about those sorts of things, but who cares? You want to put a couple of resumes side by side and tell me who's been better at their job over the last 10, 15 years, go ahead and try to be objective about it. Go ahead. But that was then, this is now. Again, the campaign, and that's what it is, it's a campaign, is for everybody to see. It's on full display. I mean, I could read some of this to you from Kevin. Beyond the two obvious needs, if there are themes that the Padres are taking into 2024 in the wake of a season that's ultimately defined by a sense of wasted opportunity, those tenets seem to be primarily resolve around alignment. Certainly, the relationship between new manager Mike Schilt and the president of baseball operations, A.J. Preller, is paramount to that aim. There may not be strong enough words to properly express the chasm in philosophy that grew into outright animosity between Preller and former manager Bob Melvin, who in October left San Diego for a job managing the Giants. <gasps> Preller subsequently found a manager who considers alignment a guiding principle. Schilt also understands the importance of the concept of Preller and has every intention of having it seep into every pore of every player in the clubhouse and ultimately having it bleed onto the field. As trite as it might seem and as intangible as it is, the words of Schilt's players indicate that many offseason dinners and text messages and phone conversations with the team's core group of leaders have had their intended effect. Schilt's done a really good job of starting those first steps to build the foundation of the team and what our identity is going to be, said Joe Musgrove. No one in uniform is blaming Melvin, but there is a quiet acknowledgement that having the air cleared of tension and toxicity won't hurt and that an increased flow of communication would help. I just wonder what the narrative would be if the organization said Bob Melvin's staying and it's toxic. Kevin, who's a journalist, doesn't have the words to describe the level of toxicity in the relationship. So it's got to be bad if Kevin Acey doesn't have words to describe it. But what would we be talking about if the organization backed Bob Melvin and not A.J. Preller? I just wonder, but we'll never know. Let's get to the JRIF call of the day. Great kid, don't get cocky. There are great legendary play-by-play moments. Gibbs trying to get the edge, does, turns it up, gets to the 10, gives to the 5, still fighting at the 3, to the end zone, touchdown Detroit Lions! Machado to deep left, and deep and far into the San Diego night, he'll walk it off! Jackson looks to push, leaving it behind for Duke, deep 3 on the right wing, got it, with a 3! Then there are some that are, well, not so great. Wilson has dropped a pair since the former LSU playmaker Tyran Matteau. I give Rich Rain great credit. Going down the right sideline. You have to get rid of this ball. We discover the difference on J. Riff's play-by-play call of the day. I kind of want you to just keep going. Let's just let's just kill the call of the day today. And let's I just want you to keep poetically reading us Kevin Acey's piece. I mean, Ace Man, you're on it as always. It's almost like humorous ASMR the way that you're doing it. Um, <laughs> history was made last night in Iowa City. Caitlin Clark becomes the NCAA's all-time leading scorer or all-time scorer in women's basketball, passing Kelsey Plum. You may have heard the calls. I don't care. It it just is the call of the day. I did bark like a dog on my broadcast last night. Maybe we can play that another time. Um, but it, it, it does not come close to Zor- Zora Stevenson on the Peacock broadcast or Rob Brooks and Jamie K.V. Lang on the Iowa radio broadcast. So let's start with the Iowa. Uh, let's start with the TV broadcast. This is Zora Stevenson calling Caitlin Clark hitting a 40-footer from the logo. This is so crazy. To break Kelsey Plum's all-time scoring record. Can we also just real quick let everybody know that wasn't watching this or, or sort of just had a passing interest in it? She was seven points shy of tying the all-time record. She needed eight points 
to break the record. These were the sixth, seventh, and eighth points for Iowa. She scored the first eight points for Iowa in this game. They're like, let's get this record. Caitlin, you score all of the points until we get this record, and that's exactly the way it played out. Oh, so I was just so teed up perfectly with how, how will she go for history? And you don't think that she's going to pull from 40 and Zora recognized it, stopped, lets it go and goes in. All right, here's the radio call. This is the Iowa Hawkeyes radio broadcasting network. Rob Brooks, who's been doing it forever, is the play-by-play -play broadcaster. Jamie KV Lang is the color analyst. Defensive assignment. Now it's a switch to Stalky. Felia gets in the paint, pull up, short jumper. No, long rebound dug up by Gabby Marshall. Scoops a pass to Clark. Logo three. Got it. 22 is now number one. Caitlin Clark is the NCAA's all-time scoring leader in women's basketball history. Fitting a logo three. No other way to do it. Good job for Jamie. She wanted to explode, and she was able to hold herself and let the the action speak for itself. That was that was expert color analyst work right there. Forty nine points, sixteen of thirty one shooting, nine for eighteen from three point range. Which, by the way, not trying to be cheap here. I would take nine for eighteen from San Diego State as a team tonight. Oh yeah, that's a team who can barely make six threes in a game. Scored the first eight. The only thing I will say: why not stop the game? How about a quick foul early in the game? Stop. I'm sure she she had her moment with the crowd, but it it should have been at the moment where you become the all-time leading scorer in NCAA history. I agree. I don't know that that's something that you can plan or something that's beyond the flow of the, you know. I, and, and you're playing to win. You don't want to burn a timeout and then need it later on in the mm -hmm. half because, they, you know, there's a play that you need to draw up coming, get going in halftime. Like, there are strategic advantages to keeping those timeouts. I'm like, you're in this game to win at the end of the day. So I understand the reasoning not to call the timeout, but I, I do agree, like, foul, let Caitlin Clark go up to the student section, do her claps, and then, you know, play on. But And then, of course, in the post-game interview, they're like, you know, Caitlin, what do you think of the game? She's like, we need to play better defense. We can't give up 89 points to Michigan. She's just ultimate competitor, man. Yeah, and she, she gave the fans that paid really, really good money to be a part of that. Not only did she deliver very early on, I hope people were in their seats early. Don't know what it is or isn't like trying to get into that building. But she still put on a show because she still went for 49, which is a career high for her. Yeah, she had 46 back in December. And then with like two minutes to go, she just drains another three from like 35 and, and gets 49. 49, 13, and five. She is the only player ever to have... I uh, 3,000 points, uh, 1,000 rebounds, 1,000 assists. It's unbelievable. And by the way, like Pete Maravich's record, which is the all-time NCAA record, men's and women's, which has been lasting since like the 60s when he was at LSU. Like she is in range to catch that scoring record as well. So Does she come back. She's got another season of eligibility, but she can turn pro. I don't know. I think she goes pro. All right. We're giving good grades across, across the, board. the board. Tens across the board. Way to go. Glad we spent a minute on that last night. 49 points. That was that was quite a performance. She's a baller, man. Hour number two. Dennis Lynn will join us in the back patio. Coming up next.
KGB and KGB FM HD2, San Diego. San Diego Sports. 760, America's finest sports station. This update is presented by Jackson Hewitt. It matters who does your taxes. Aztecs back in action tonight. It's a big one. The boys are at home against New Mexico. Both teams one game back from the top spot in the Mountain West Conference. That's against, or that belongs to Utah State, and the Aztecs have to go to Utah State pretty soon. So, boy, they got to get the win here tonight. It's also a revenge game. The last home loss for the Aztecs came last year in January, 88-70. to To the Lobos, our pregame coverage starts at 6. Our tip-off is at 7. All the action right here on San Diego Sports 760. History in Iowa City last night. Caitlin Clark becomes the NCAA's all-time leading scorer in women's hoops, passing Kelsey Plum's 3,527 career points. She also set a new single game high with 49 points, 13 rebounds, 5 assists. And, of course, Xander Bogarts now moving to second base. Hassan Kim back over to short. Why are people saying hoo to Jackson Hewitt? When you switch to Jackson Hewitt, they'll beat what you paid for last year on tax prep. Even if you filed online, proof of prior year's payment required when filing new clients only at participating locations through the 7th of April. Terms at jacksonhewitt.com. All right, hour number two, San Diego Sports 760. I just hit the wrong button in here. All of a sudden, I was listening to the Genesis Invitational. Didn't know I could do that. Patrick Cantley, by the way, nine under par. Let's go back to the Peoria Sports Complex, to the back patio. I see Dennis Lynn standing by, even though it says on the image, since we're streaming this, at Marty Caswell. He's at Dennis Lynn. He writes for The Athletic. Following an off day, he joins us from San Diego Sports yeah. Hey, Darren. I'm having just a little trouble hearing you, but uh, maybe. All right. Well, we can figure this stuff out. This is, you know, when you don't do things like this on a regular basis. You know, we had Michael King on. I think we had one interruption for Michael King in the first hour of the show where he disappeared for about 20, 30 seconds or what have you. So we are going to head back out to the patio of the Peoria Sports Pot Complex here momentarily. By the way, Xander Bogards has just spoken or is currently speaking to the media on the back patio. So remember, Padres yesterday, total off day. Marty was broadcasting from a restaurant somewhere in Glendale. Don't really know what the situation was. So Jay Riff will give me the thumbs up when he feels like we've had our, our situation <laughs> squared away. San Diego State tonight, 7 o'clock. It's a blackout at the Ajas Arena. No. We do not have tickets to give away. Text line. I appreciate you searching for the tickets. If something pops up, I'll let you know, but we don't have any. If we do, you'll be the first, but we, we don't. I wish we did. Should be a great game. Seven o'clock here on San Diego Sports 760. All right, let's try it again. Back patio, Peoria Sports Complex. Dennis Lynn of the Athletic. Dennis, do you got us? I got you, Darren. Do you have me? I do. You look good. You sound good. Everything's going great. Dennis, how's spring training so far? Uh, well, as you can see uh, behind me, um, there's actually more people here than last year. Uh, and I think that has something to do with the fact that there are four prominent Asian players on this team. But uh, it's a little different this year. <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah, usually there is this uh, very friendly critique of press boxes when, in fact, it is that you get popular Asian players that are visiting or playing for your squad, Dennis. It's, it's going to be a little bit busier in the press box this year, isn't it? Yeah, I'm really uh, looking forward to. I don't know if looking forward to is the right phrase, but I, I think Dodger Stadium's press box is going to need a, maybe a slight expansion this year. I'm going to, I'm pretty curious to see what that looks like. Uh, what'd you do yesterday, off day? I was telling Marty, went for a hike and then I uh, searched for my passport because apparently I need a visa to go to uh, Korea, even though it's only for a week. Huh. How about that? Where'd you go hiking? North Mountain, Central Phoenix. Quick hike. Uh, pretty steep, but get it over with quick and feel slightly better about yourself instead of just, you know, sitting in front of a computer all spring and uh, eating like crap. Yeah, I get it. Uh, you have plenty of time for that. Uh, I thought maybe Camelback. Have you ever been to the top of Camelback Mountain? I have. It's been a it's been a few years. Um, I'm not I'm not built up for that, Darren. Yet it's uh, it's pitchers and catchers, or I guess full squad today. But I'm definitely still in uh, off season mode myself. 
All right. Well, ask Marty sometime about the time she attempted to hike Camelback Mountain in a pair of flip flops. Just that, that'll be a good off air story. I'm sure Marty will have her version of what it was that happened. Uh, I have my version of what happened, and I promise mine is much closer to the truth. I'm going to ask her right after this. Uh, well, Dennis, you tell us today. Um, I don't know that today's the, the, you know, the news of the day, obviously, is Xander Bogarts. And this is Mike Schilt announcing a little bit earlier that Xander Bogarts is going to be the everyday starting second baseman for the Padres. Hassan Kim is going to be the starting shortstop. I don't know that this is uh, earth shattering, but it's still newsworthy. Uh, what did you make of, of today being the day that, that we found out what it was that was happening this year? Yeah, not earth shattering, uh, maybe a little surprising. Um, I think we all knew this was possible, but just the fact that uh, they were able to, to basically get this move out of the way so soon, I guess, is uh, props to the Padres, but also let's keep in mind, and props to Xander too. I mean, it's a huge move for a guy who's ex almost exclusively played shortstop his entire career, including in the minors, but let's keep in mind that the guy has uh, $280 million in the bank already, so... That less to steam a little bit. Uh, he does have a lot of pride as a professional, a guy who's worked really hard to improve at shortstop into his 30s. So it is a big move. And uh, I think, uh, you know, Mike Schultz obviously went down to Aruba, you know, back in December to try to lay the groundwork. And I think some of that groundwork started before because Andrew said that was not the first time someone with the organization had talked to him about, you know, this potential, uh, you know, move. Uh, I know they had talked about it when he first signed, but, you know, you're into a $280 million contract. It's not something uh, you bargain for when you, uh, play shortstop your entire career right and and that's the question i'm sure dennis that you'll be asked in your next padres mailbag at theathletic.com is the question we've already been asked and it's the question that many are asking on social media why not do this last year you know if in fact hassan kim was on his way to a gold glove winning season why wasn't this done last year and i do feel like a lot of people are implying like why wasn't it that bob melvin did this why did it take mike schultz to do this yeah, I think um, that's, you know, whoever the manager is, whether it's Bob Melvin, Mike Schilt, Andy Green, uh, you know, it could, could be uh, basically like Bill Belichick of whoever's talking to Sander Bogart. It's your first year in a new city uh, after you spent your entire career with one organization, spent your entire career at one position. I don't know how fair that is asking someone to uh, move, even if they've already been paid all that money. Um, so, you know, even if it was Mike Schilt last year, I, I don't think this move would have been made. So, you know, a year in, I think he, he clearly sees that. Hassan Kim from up close, from in-person experience, is a really, really good defender, um, the best shortstop on the team. I think he would, he, he and other people would admit to you, obviously. Um, but, yeah, you give a guy uh, room to time to settle in. And, yeah, maybe it didn't work out so great for the team last year. Um, from an individual standpoint, I mean, Xander was fine at shortstop. I, I think if you talk to people who, who watch this game for a living, uh, you know, he was, he was fine. But it wasn't, you know, Hassan Kim level. And Hassan Kim wanted to go love mostly playing second base. So I think in the end, it kind of worked out. But, I mean, right now this year, they, they got to, I guess, uh, you know, mine the margins for any advantage they can get with a lower payroll. So this is probably their best defensive alignment if you're, uh, you know, going to leave Jake Cronworth at first base. Right. And, and there's a lot of layers to this. And I, I do think it's it's interesting, not just manufactured interest. Dennis Lynn of The Athletic is joining us from Peoria. And you just said it there. From from I don't know what everybody uses. Maybe Dennis, you use fan graphs, but Xander Bogarts was a positive WAR defensive player last year, so he wasn't a problem at short. Hassan Kim won a Gold Glove, being a utility player playing mostly at second base. So, uh, do you see any risk to this? You know, do you see any risk? Clearly, it looks like an upgraded shortstop moving Kim to short, but what about moving Xander Bogarts to second base? Yeah, I think the number one thing, and this has already been talked about, is just kind of learning the angles of, you know, not having the ball in front of you. Like, you don't have to turn your head to see where the ball is coming from, especially on double plays all the time. Now your your back's going to be to the play sometimes. And even Kim, who's played second base uh, a lot in the past, too, uh, you know, when he came back from the WBC where he was playing shortstop a year ago and he was, uh, you know, working at second base, getting ready for the season to accommodate Xander, you know, being at shortstop. Uh, that was a little bit of adjustment, and I think there were people in the organization saying, you know, Kim's not really that great at second base anymore. This, this isn't like, you know, maybe what we expected, and then it just took some time. And Obviously, Kim, again, has the advantage of having played a lot of second base in his past, uh, a lot more than Xander, at least. So I think that's going to be the number one thing. Um, but, I mean, he's he's a middle infielder. Uh, he'll probably figure it out. He's athletic, and he has pretty good hands. So I expect, uh, you know, with his arm strength, uh, it's probably a better fit. You know, the arm strength uh, isn't, you know, quite in the upper echelon for shortstops. And 
second base is a shorter way to go, obviously, uh, needless to say. So I think uh, I think he'll just be he'll be just fine out there. But, you know, again, you're also getting the advantage of putting a gold glove winner back at shortstop. And, you know, he's he obviously was really good there, too. He didn't just win that gold glove for uh, playing second base. He was a utility gold glove guy. So I think uh, they, they think very strongly. I think most people outside the organization agree, too. This is probably, you know, for the best. Yeah, and, and again, I think that there's also a couple of, of other layers to it. Number one would be, I guess, as unlikely as it might be that they were going to trade Hassan Kim, and you have written about this recently, Dennis, does this for you close the door on any potential trade for Hassan Kim between now and the start of the season? I wouldn't say so. I mean, it's always been a likely that, you know, he's going to get traded, especially before uh, Seoul, South Korea. Not that, that, that That's their only determining factor, but... Um, I was actually just talking with someone just how funny would it be if this is all a whole kind of like sham where, you know, they say Xander Bogart to, to second base and Hassan Kim Kim gets traded the next day. And so, oh, Xander, you're back at shortstop. But no, I think this is just looking at what they have right now. And it's also maybe a nice little bonus for Kim in a contract year that he's going to be playing maybe his uh, most valuable position. I mean, it is his most valuable position. So oh. if he has a big year defensively and I don't know how much uh, Xander consider this I mean he's a good teammate and like you said like we said earlier he uh he saw what Kim can do at shortstop uh you know maybe that puts more money in Hassan Kim's pocket you know regardless of whichever team he's on next year and the other uh I, I guess as unlikely as it was that you know there would be massive movement around the infield and Jake Cronenworth would come off first base and go back to the position where he broke into the big leagues playing second base I guess we can we can close the door on that one even more definitively than we can any sort of potential Hassan Kim trade. Yeah, it looks that way. And uh, keep in mind, like, I know they kind of have to say this right now, but Mike Schultz said, you know, this is not etched in stone 100%. We're going to see how Xander feels out there at second base, how he, how comfortable he is, how he goes about it. So there, there's always, they always reserve the right to, you know, flip these guys back to, uh, you know, Kim at second base mostly. And Xander, short if it doesn't go well. Um, but yeah, I think if you're going to look at the writing on the wall, yeah, it's most likely, uh, you know, Jake Cronenworth playing mostly at first base and that's not ideal for him, but you know, he's got a much smaller contract than Xander. And uh, yeah, I mean, he, he really has played first base unlike Xander. I know a lot of people think the best alignment would be Xander at first base, but um, yeah, asking a middle infielder to uh, move to first base in the second year of a huge contract like this, that would be uh, less ideal than this. Right. I mean, at least last year, this is improvement, right? Because you had two players playing at positions where they weren't their best. Now you have one. I guess I get, well, I don't know to be determined on Xander Bogarts. The other thing I think Dennis sort of um, from a inner, inner clubhouse philosophical viewpoint is, you know, I've heard Musgrove a couple different times talk about identifying our identity. We didn't do this last year, checking egos. We're still talking about checking egos. I know how convenient it has been for a lot of fans to blame Soto, to blame hater, to a much lesser extent, blame Snell, blame Bob Melvin, blame people who weren't here for some of the the fragility, the, the, the perceived fragility of the clubhouse. But but I think it's easy to to identify this as, as a player in Sander Bogart's doing something and accepting something very publicly early on in the season that that can can be said it's obvious, but it also, you know, he's prideful. I mean, he's he's got ego. Major league pay players, professional athletes have to have egos. But I, I think this is sort of a, a step into some of what it is that Joe Musgrove seems to be talking about an awful lot, which is egos off to the side. I'm not saying Xander Bogarts was a problem. I don't know that. But in terms of, of wanting to identify some of the things that went wrong in 2023, do you think that, that this is something that could be applied to that conversation? Right, I do. And I think maybe after you have a year like 2023, maybe that uh... – the openness to doing different things, it becomes a little more easy. And obviously there's more impetus to maybe change your mind about certain things. Um, you know, one thing you hear about this club, uh, especially last year when they had all the stars together, including Soto, and I'm not singling anyone out. It's just like, all these guys have come up and had success their own way. So like, why are they just going to listen to just any coach they just met, especially if you're new coming in? So when you fail, and you fail in a big way, very publicly, uh, naturally, you would think, and these guys are wired different, but just I think the average person would maybe be a little more inclined to do something different. So I think the whole the manager conversation is a very interesting one, but I think uh, if, you, if you ask me in the end, I mean, the manager is not the, the biggest factor here. It's kind of the composition of the clubhouse, and 
how this team is put together. But yeah, also, uh, you know, when you fall down like the Padres did in 2023 and, you know, no one's hyping you up. Although, again, there's a lot of people here for some reason. Uh, yeah, maybe a, a change in expectations and a change in mindset, um, you know, being willing to do some different things because you failed uh, will make a big difference. And, and it sort of has surprised me that, that there seems to be so much conversation about 2023. Dennis, you, you're there. I, I don't sense that these are exclusively answers to questions that the players are being asked about. It, it feels like, I'm guessing here, that there was some soul-searching from this past offseason and, and certain players, introspective-type players, players like Joe Musgrove and others, have shown up here and like, huh. Yeah, we know. We really we effed up last year and, and we gotta make sure we don't we don't do that again. It's a different team, obviously. It's a totally different situation and environment, but we gotta make sure we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Yeah, and I can't, you know, I can't speak individually for any of them, but uh this has obviously been talked about this obviously in er this offseason in early spring. I mean, you know, Peter Siler's passing and just thinking about all he poured into the team and what a huge wasted opportunity, the kind of opportunity they, they might never get again that they wasted in 23. Um, yeah, that, that might make you think a little differently about how you went about, went about things. And I think the thing about Peter is um, I think, you know, I'm just speculating here. I can't get in, you know, what he was into, into what he was thinking, but I think he probably went into, uh, you know, last spring thinking he was going to have more time, unfortunately. And um, it wasn't just about, you know, I'm just, you know, I think I have limited time left on this earth, unfortunately, and I'm just going to pour everything into 2023. But, you know, when a guy like uh, Peter Sidler, um, you know, leaves the organization and is out of the picture, um, yeah, things can change drastically and they have changed drastically. And I know there's been talk about this was always the plan, but I don't think it was going to be this drastic. And I think there was going to be, uh, you know, Peter's Peter was still around. They'd still be in a very different place, but now he's not. And it, again, it was a huge wasted opportunity. And yeah, that would probably naturally prompt some soul searching. So what's left for the Padres between now and the start of the season? Obviously, they're going to present opportunities to players from internal opportunities presented. You know, Jackson Merrill being the best example that we can give anybody, Dennis. What, what's left on the to-do list for the Padres and how do they check the boxes on their to-do list? Yeah, they could use a major league outfield for uh, for starters. Uh, I think that's at the top of the list. And I think they were even having some, I don't have any specifics right now, but I think they're still actively talking to teams yesterday when they uh, shut down the uh, complex just to spite Marty <laughs> or maybe have some secret uh, kind of secret meetings here at the complex, who knows? Um, but yeah, they're actively talking to teams and I think they're maybe a little bit limited. Obviously they are actually, uh, in terms of maybe who they're looking at, you know, guys not making a ton of money, it'd probably be where they would prefer, or if they're going to maybe wait out Tommy Pham or, uh, Michael A. Taylor on some of these free agent asks, but yeah, you know, outfield is, uh, kind of been the consistent drumbeat that, yeah, they'd still like to add one, even after your guy, Dirk and Profar, you know, he's, uh, I think he might still be stuck, uh, you know, getting his visa and trying to get into camp, but you know, he's the guy they see as more of a fourth outfielder right now, bench bat. And yeah, they could always use, use more starting pitching, but like the message right now, maybe this is just posturing is that they, they believe in a lot of these young pitchers. They believe in Ruben Yabla and if they don't, they don't go into the season and add another, you know, veteran arm. Uh, it won't be the end of the world. They can still do it at some point during the season. But I think they're ready to test a lot of these young pitchers. But yeah, you know, out take another outfielder or two, and you know, possibly a starting pitcher would be uh, would be what you're looking at. And I didn't think the Padres are going to add Wani Peralta, you know, a month ago. So who knows about the bullpen too? And and do you sense Dennis that they they have some financial flexibility? What, what limitations are they dealing with? I'll just give you an example. And I, I, I'm not saying that I thought Jorge Soler would have been a good fit. I, I never really gave that any thought. But, you know, whatever that contract was, uh, uh, you probably know. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Is that the kind of deal that they, they can work with financially? Is that a deal that's sort of out of their price range? What is your sense of, of how much financial flexibility they still have remaining? Yeah, something like that. And I don't remember, uh, like you, off the top of my head, what that was, maybe like 15, 14 million a year, uh, mm -hmm. something in that range uh, for one player. When they have multiple needs, that would probably be tough, uh, especially if you have to outbid for a player like that. And again, how many players are left like that? You know, there's a couple guys, I guess, but yeah, Cody Bellinger's not walking through that door. Uh, Blake Snell, unless uh, Scott Boris wants to drag this out into July or whenever it is uh, these guys finally sign. But um, yeah, they. Um, if you look at some of the public projections, and I've asked people with the team before, like how accurate are these? And generally, they're the cots and fan graphs. Uh, they're generally, you know, right around where they are. Um, they have a pretty good idea. So they they might have I don't know 15 to 20 million left, and they want to 
ideally open the season with some buffer room if they want to add during the season. So I think if they if you're looking at at least two players you need to add, uh, yeah, that, that kind of limits you in terms of flexibility. Um, but you know, this is where the Padres are, and this is probably what happens when you sign a shortstop for two hundred eighty million dollars and move them <laughs> off position uh, less than uh, you know less than two seasons in. Yeah, uh, Solaire, three years, forty-two million bucks. So, what's the math on that? Fourteen million per. Like, like that feels like it might be just a little bit out of their price range. Yeah, and I think he he was a guy they were interested in last year, probably for around. And I think he was asking for maybe something similar, and that wasn't something they were very interested in doing. And then he had a pretty good year for himself. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of slim pickings, even though there's a lot of free agents out there. So, I think that they're going to be very selective, like you know, Hunt Young and Ryu, Ryu, someone they've talked to, and. You know, again, a Scott Boras client, so not always very easy, but there are rumors that he might go back to Korea if he doesn't, you know, get what he's looking for and finish out his career there. And I don't think those two sides are anywhere close right now on, um, you know, doing something. But, uh, yeah, I mean, even a guy like that who's almost 37 coming off his second Tommy John, they're going to have to be pretty picky there. Yeah, you're also chumming the water, too, on some potential trades. Dangling that out there at theathletic.com. Dan is getting lots of engagement. It's content season, and you are – Right at the top of the the line there, po- posting up all the content. Yeah, I can't I can't do it quite like Jim Bowden, but uh, yeah, I try <laughs> I try I try to you know, throw a little nuggets out there when I can, and feels right. Yeah, I mean, do you sense like like the trade market? Is that more likely than any potential bargain in free agency? I I'm predicting probably a combination. I mean, it's not like they're going to add four more players or five more players. Eh, who knows? It's probably so. Maybe he <laughs> trades someone off the team that we're not expecting. Uh, you know, outside of Hassan Kim, who you know, you never know if uh, someone blows him away. I, I don't think uh, he's going to hang up the phone. But uh, yeah, I think a trade is uh, you know pretty likely at some point. And if you can uh, trade some prospect depth for a controllable guy who's not making too much money, that would probably be the ideal world. But you know, those guys are very val- valued by other teams and therefore very hard to get Dennis great to see you great to chat with you thank you as always for the insight thank you as always for uh, providing us with lots and lots of content that we rely on on the show when things are are kind of boring and slow moving we appreciate you very much we'll talk again soon thanks Darren I'm gonna get off right now and uh ask Marty about her uh, hiking trip and her flip-flops yeah hiking Camelback Mountain flip-flops who doesn't do that highly highly unrecommended not recommended See you later. Dennis Lynn, everybody of The Athletic. All right. Uh, we'll hear more from what Mike Schoen had to say earlier today. We'll hear a little bit from Xander Bogarts from earlier today. Still want to get into San Diego State, New Mexico coming up later on tonight. It feels like it's an elimination game for the Mountain West Conference regular season title. Maybe a bit premature, but with six games to go and a really, really challenging road game at Utah State. Man, I mean, this is the biggest game of the season until next week when they play at Utah State. So, Utah State over the weekend is playing another game. Colorado State tomorrow afternoon, but this one tonight is going to be incredible. I'm so excited. Can't wait to watch it a little later on this evening. We'll be back after this.
San Diego Sports Now. This update is presented by Jackson Hewitt. It matters who does your taxes. Breaking news from the Padres from this morning. Xander Bogart's moving from short to second. Hassan Kim back to short. Aztec Hoops returns tonight. And boys, it a big one. Taking on New Mexico. Both teams one game behind Utah State for the top spot in the Mountain West Conference. Six games to go. The Aztecs' last home loss came to New Mexico last year in January. And of course, the 88-70 to thrashing that they took in the pit earlier this season. Our pregame coverage gets going at 6. The tip-off is at 7. All the action right here on San Diego Sports 760. History in Iowa City last night. Caitlin Clark became the NCAA's all-time scorer in women's hoops, passing Kelsey Plum for 3,527 points. It took her about two minutes of game time to get her eight points that she needed to surpass Plum. Why are people saying hoo to Jackson Hewitt? When you switch to Jackson Hewitt, they'll beat what you paid last year on tax prep. Even if you filed online, proof of prior year payment is required when filing. New clients only at participating locations through April 7th. Terms at jacksonhewitt.com. All right, John and Jim coming up at 3 o'clock. They're going to be here in studio this afternoon. The pregame show, San Diego State for New Mexico tonight. San Diego State's favored by 6.5 at Vieja House Arena. You can listen to this. Pregame show starts at 6 o'clock here on San Diego Sports 760. Tip-off coming up at 7. You can listen to the pregame show. You can visit the pregame show. That is going to be live from outside of Vieja House Arena. I don't know what that means. I don't know what time Schaefer decides that he's going to pull the ripcord and ditch Jim. But at some point, he will ditch Jim and drive on out there to the Mesa, and Jim will be here doing Jim things, and Schaefer will be out there to prepare for the pregame show, which starts at 6 o'clock tonight. When you look at the standings, you see Utah State at 9-3. and three. You see San Diego State in New Mexico sitting there with identical 8-4 and four records. So there's only six left. You heard Dave Velasquez the other day say, hey, we're, we're, we're planning on going 6-0. and oh. He didn't say it like that. He wasn't making a prediction. He wasn't being bold. wasn't making a guarantee. He's just simply saying what you'd expect Dave Velasquez to say. Like, we're, our, we're, we're going 6-0. and oh. Like, we want to be 6-0. and oh. That starts tonight, New Mexico. Obviously, there's a little bit of an extra incentive aside from standings, defending your Mountain West Conference regular season title. Like, like I don't, crazy things can happen, and who can predict an unpredictable sport, especially this year in the Mountain West? But I think it's reasonable to think that the loser of this game is, is going to be looking up at two teams with five to go. You wouldn't love those chances. You wouldn't love those odds. You'd really not like those odds if you're San Diego State and all of the tiebreakers are towards New Mexico. Now, again, I don't know that we've yet looked into the Mountain West Conference tiebreakers. Maybe we give that another week because some of the projection sites seem to suggest that it's very likely that not just two, but perhaps three teams will end up deadlocked on top of the Mountain West Conference standing. Six and a half surprises me. Not that this is a gambling show, but J. Riff is a basketball play-by-play man. This is this is a bigger number than I would have thought, even for a Friday night, a blackout crowd. Bigger number than I would have thought at home on Friday night. Yeah, that's. I was thinking maybe I the Aztec should be favored one hundred percent. I mean, their chip on their shoulder, the way that they just absolutely dominated Colorado State in the second half of the last game. Like you would think that they're for sure going to be favored. I probably would have said like three and a half felt like a fair. Um, spread to open up this game at and just see where the public takes it. But six and a half is a lot of points. And New Mexico is, I mean, we saw what they did in the pit, but this is a team, four of their five starters average 12 or more points. They shoot almost 48% as a team. They're defensively, they're like top 10 and top 15 in the nation in steals. It This is one of, like, they're always a difficult team in the Mountain West Conference, but this is by far one of the best most complete teams that we have seen in quite some time. And they haven't swept the Aztecs in the regular season since the 2016, 2017 season. So there's that chip on their shoulder and they know the Aztecs haven't lost at home this season. So there's that chip on their shoulder. So, I mean, they come in with more, I think they come in feeling like they have more to lose, not to mention the Aztecs are the reigning Mountain West conference champions. And they also made a national championship and there's always a, a target on your back a little bit more so than other teams when you're in that position. So, 
I just, I, I think that six and a half is a lot of points to give the Aztecs in this, but I also don't, I don't see why the Aztecs don't win this game, but I also could see why New Mexico can win this game. It feels like it's, it's going to be tense late. Feels like it'll be one of those. Plus everybody knows both sides know the last time San Diego state lost at home was last season to New Mexico. Now there's an interesting story. Mark Ziegler wrote in the union tribune today, and it is about Jalen house. Jalen house is, is. He's a, uh, a lightning rod kind of player for New Mexico. And they have a reporter for the Albuquerque Journal. His name is Jeff Grammer. He was on with John and Jim yesterday. He's, you know, in addition to Ziegler, I would say there's a handful of reporters who cover Mountain West Conference teams that, that you know, you look and you go, oh, yeah, like these are guys that, that cover not just their local teams, but they cover, you know, they do cover the, the sport as a whole. And he said this, Jalen House is the most hated player of 10 fan bases and gets the most hate during games of any player that I've ever covered. This is journalist Jeff Grammer who tweeted this. And you read the story, you go, yeah, classic case of a player who you hate when he's on an opposition team and you love him when he's on yours. You absolutely love him when he's on your squad, don't you? And, and it's tricky because you don't really want to taunt a player like this because he seemingly feeds off that. It reminds you of Reggie Miller. It reminds you a little bit of Draymond Green, right? Like there are certain guys uh, like that, that, you know, you can get them to cross the line. Draymond Green would be a great example of that. I don't know who was watching the Warriors last night, but then there's Reggie Miller who, who's fueled by that sort of stuff. And it seems to me without having a ton of exposure to New Mexico basketball, but for the handful of times that San Diego state plays them that Jalen House feels like one of those guys. So what are you supposed to do? Are you going to try to get in that guy's head? That's what he's inviting. That's what he wants. All right, let's go back to the back patio of the Peoria Sports Complex. The Higster is stopping by for a few minutes. He was part of the trade that we discussed a little bit earlier. Juan Soto to New York, Michael King, Randy Vasquez, Drew Thorpe, Johnny Burrito, and Padres catcher Kyle Higashioka joining us. On San Diego Sports 760, the Higster. Thanks for stopping by. This is Darren back in San Diego. How are you? All right. We got to get you unmuted there, and then we'll be all uh, good to go. So uh, ask Marty right behind you there. Tell her that your mic is on mute, and we'll we'll get you up and running here, Kyle, because I think the people want to not just see you since we're streaming it, but I think the people want to hear it. There you go. All oh, right. yeah. I can hear you now. You How you doing? I can hear myself, too. <laughs> Much better. Right? Yeah, Radio 101. Me. Thanks for doing this. No problem. How's it going? It's going great. I'm loving it here. Uh, you know, getting to meet all my new teammates and uh, having a great time. What is the uh, the Higster all about? I just noticed that on social media today. Is this uh, is this is this something that people refer to you? Is this how we should refer to you? Uh, most people call me Higgy, but you know, in the early days of Twitter, you kind of had to try to find a, a <laughs> Twitter handle that wasn't taken. So uh, I added a little underscore in there, and it was luckily it was open. All right, the good. closest to my name I could get. I guess so. You're a Southern California guy, right? So unlike Michael King, who we just met, who had never been to Arizona, who I don't think it's been a ton of time in Southern California. This is uh, after all the years in the Yankees organization, Kyle, this is uh this is a bit of a homecoming for you. How exciting is that aspect? Your family from Huntington beach. Yeah. Super exciting. I mean, there's uh not, not many people are more excited than my mom about that. She can uh, come see me play quite often whenever she wants. So it's, it's good. It is good as well too. Now that also means the, the flip side of that coin is I'm, I'm sure you're going to be responsible for, for lots of high school friends and family members who are going to say, Hey, I'd love to go spend a weekend in San Diego. <laughs> Kyle, uh, can you leave some tickets at will call for us? Oh yeah. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> What's the process been like? Tell us what it's like switching organizations at this stage of your career. Uh, pitchers and catchers reported before everybody else, as we all know. What's the the whole experience been like for you? Uh, it's been great. It's been really good. I think I've uh, you know I've settled in really really nicely with the guys and and with the staff. So it's been. Um, I, I think the Padres run a, a really good, really good. Um, you know the process is really good here. So um, I think the off season was the toughest part of transitioning because you never know what you're you're walking into, and um, you know it's just nervous at times uh you know how how it's gonna it's gonna feel being around new guys in a new organization but i think um you know the, the padres and, and then the staff and the team they're they're 
awesome, top quality. So really happy to be here. Kyle, I would love to hear it from you as somebody who's been success, as successful as you have at your position. Can you define like like what what the priorities are for a big league catcher? Can you can you tell us just you know what the most important things are? How you prioritize from from defense to to pitching to everything that goes into game planning to to hitting like like when you describe what a catcher does in Major League Baseball, what do you what do you tell people? Yeah, I mean. I, I come from the uh, old school Joe Girardi philosophy of you're gonna you're gonna save more runs than you're gonna drive in as a catcher. So you have you have such a an impact on the game in terms of pitch calling and receiving and blocking and throwing that um, obviously if you want to stay at this level you you have to hit um, and that that's super important. You can't win the game unless you unless you score runs. But um, definitely number one priority for me has always been defense. I think. Getting the pitchers to to work at their optimal level has been, um, you know, that that's the top priority, and and that seems like one of the recipes for success as a team. And when does a, a mindset like that settle in for a player? Right? I mean, everybody wants to hit. It's been a billion years since I was a little league player. Not that I was any good, Kyle, but you know, I everybody wanted to hit. When does the mindset of of what it is that a catcher does and doesn't prioritize? When does that sort of settle in for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I prioritize my hitting a, as much as anything else. It's just I know that, you know, on the field, I, I will have a bigger impact behind the plate than, than at the plate because you're you're involved with every single pitch the, the pitcher throws, whereas at the plate, I mean, you're up, you know, four, maybe five times a game. Um, but you're never going to make it to the big leagues if you don't hit, but mm-hmm. you're never going to stay there if you don't play defense, so – you, you kind of have to, you have to have both. What were you doing when you were 17 years old? Uh, high school, you know, just trying to, <laughs> trying to figure out life. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, and it probably wasn't an easy thing to figure out when you were 17, when you look at, at a catcher in the system, when you look at, at Ethan Salas, who's 17 years old, and I'm sure, Kyle, you're a smart guy, you probably figured out where this question was going. I mean, how inconceivable does it seem that, you know, you have a guy who you're working out with every single day who's 17 years old? It's crazy. I mean, the the first time I met him, he, uh, he, he told somebody that he was the bat boy, and I kind of believed <laughs> it because I was like, I was like, man, this guy's really young, but... When you when you talk to him and you meet him, he you, you would you would swear that he's in his twenties and he, he's so much more mature than than a typical seventeen year old. And I think that's one of the reasons that he's been having so much success and that he's he's such a, a high prospect. What's it been like? Uh, who have you had a chance to catch so far? Uh, well, today I caught Cosgrove and uh, Iriarte. Um, I've caught almost everyone on the staff in the bullpen, but. Um, I mean, just for as far as today goes, Iriarte and Cosgrove were were excellent. So um, Iriarte is a pretty pretty exciting prospect. He's got great stuff. Have you caught Darvish yet? Yeah, a couple of bullpens. He looks good. What, really what's good. it like? We hear about the Arsenal. We hear like he had nine, and and maybe he's added to the repertoire. Uh, what's it What's it like just getting up to speed with you, Darvish? Given how many different types of pitches that he throws, it's great because. Not only does he have a lot of pitches, but he he knows how and when to use them and where to throw them. And so, um, I think for him, every everything is is just a tool in the toolbox um, instead of just throwing it to throw it. So he's he's so experienced and he's got you know such a track record of success. Uh, he's always a guy that that you look forward to working with. Right, and and in today's baseball, right, you don't have to come up with a bunch of different you know, signs with your hands, right. Or, or paint your fingers and your fingernails and put a bunch of tape on, right. Like all of that is, is, are the Padres almost exclusively through the, the speaker and the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all, all pitch com. And it, it actually has turned into an advantage for, for us as, you know, pitcher and catcher, because we can kind of, uh, indicate, exactly what we want and it's easier and not having to worry about um sign sequences with a guy on second um it makes everything very clear so it, it's it's actually turned into a big um a big benefit and and whose voice is on the pitch com do you know 
I don't know yet. I haven't I haven't heard the one here yet. Oh, you haven't? Okay. See, no. sometimes, right, don't the catchers want to have their voices there, and then you slip in some little words of inspiration? <laughs> yeah, at times. With uh, <laughs> with the Yankees, we had we had them do um, just like a, a robot voice because it came through the the speaker a lot a lot clearer, um, like more like a dictation software, right? Like uh, AI. Because having having somebody say it into a microphone, it was it was getting really soft and unclear, so it was, it was kind of tough to understand. See, you would be a perfect person too, just given the the breakdown of the staff. You are are trilingual. You can speak in English, Japanese, and Spanish. So you would you would seem to be a prime candidate to be the voice of Pitchcom for the Padres in 2024. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not I'm not a like a, a great hype guy, so they might they might be falling asleep on the mound if I'm talking <laughs> on the microphone. Do us one quick favor before we go. Um, we're learning a little bit about some of the players that got traded over here from the Yankees. Uh, you know, you know, word association, Kyle, I'm sure. Uh, I'll just yep. rattle off the name and and just tell us, you know, uh, a quick couple of words on on each of these guys. Michael King. I mean, he's he's a competitor. He's a bulldog. Super super intelligent. Um, knows what he's doing. Great stuff. By the way, we had him on the show earlier. He's the nicest human being. Is he a different oh, yeah. person when he's on the mound? He's got to be, right? Oh yeah, yeah. He's he's a lot more tenacious on the mound. He he yelled at me one time last year. What did you do? Did you I, do get, I give it right back to him all the time. I give it right back to him. But uh, <laughs> who, was, who was wrong? No, Anybody? It was actually against the Padres. He came out to the mound from the bullpen, and he said he wanted to throw a slider first pitch. And I I disagreed with him, and I I made him throw a sinker. And then the guy Kim Kim got a RBI single on that pitch, and I I felt like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I deserved it. Uh, Drew Thorpe. Uh, great kid. I, I actually haven't caught Thorpe yet, but I mean he's he's already one of my my favorite guys in the clubhouse. Uh, super super nice kid. I heard he's got electric stuff, so I can't wait. Again, and some of these guys maybe not a ton of experience with Randy Vasquez. You have anything that you could share with us? Oh yeah, um, I mean he's got a great arsenal. Every everything he throws is is good. So I mean he's just so unpredictable because he can use any pitch in any scenario, and and you can't really pin down what he's going to go to Johnny Brito pretty much the same thing I mean great arsenal very very complex arsenal with the you know four seam sinker cutter curveball slider change up I mean any pitch in any count he, he knows how to pitch especially for a young guy it's it's really impressive so Good, good scouting reports Kyle we appreciate it thank you for doing this we know it's it's sort of full squad here probably a lot of a lot of chaos going around the facility. We thank you very much for taking the time to join us. I hope we get a chance to do it again. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. You got it. Thank you. That is uh, Padre catcher Kyle Higashioka stopping by Southern California guy, Huntington Beach. He will have plenty of family, I'm sure, that will be driving down the 405 to the 5 freeway. Maybe they'll take the 73. Who knows? Pay the toll. They can make their way down here on a weekend. Or better yet, you know, just take a train, and you can catch a, a fun weekend of uh, Padre action. I was thinking about that after we got done with Michael King. I was like, this is such a nice person. There's got to be another side to Michael King. There's just got to be a gear that he has that clearly he doesn't need to operate with every single day. But I bet you there's a lot more to that on days where he's out there on the mound. All right. Thank you to the Higster. We'll be back.
Get the text coming up, hour number three. Also, we have a four-pack of tickets to the Symbiotica San Diego Open, Barnes Tennis Center coming up February 24th to the 3rd of March. Tickets and info at WTASDopen.com. So stay tuned for that. San Diego Sports 760. Chances to win 1000 bucks every weekday. All you have to do, listen from 9 to 5. Listen for the keyword, enter it at sportsSD.com. We'll read your text coming up. Hour number three, Xander Bogart spoke a little bit earlier today. We'll listen to that. Open to interpretation. Our colleague Jim Russell thinks that Xander Bogarts didn't sound too pleased to be talking about switching positions. So we'll all put it under the microscope coming up, hour number three, and get our thoughts. We were watching the Genesis Invitational, and I looked up at the screen, and I saw Tiger Woods in a golf cart. And I said, probably not great. Tiger has withdrawn from the Genesis Invitational now. This is his third WD in his last six tournaments. This one, because of illness. There's illness for Tiger Woods. Now, you can say, well, what was his score? I don't have it in front of me. I think he was one or two over. One or two over. Currently, the leader's at 10 under. This is the Genesis Invitational. Xander Shoffley just finished his round at five under par, so five off the pace from his buddy Patrick Cantley. But Tiger, golf cart. Sometimes we've seen Tiger go, eh, I think I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm out. I'll see y'all later. I, I'm going to just get myself. Now, that probably is above the cut line, I'm guessing, if the cut, if the leader's at 10 under par, I'm guessing he could have made the cut and played for the weekend, but some of the clips that I've seen haven't exactly shown Tiger in his prime. Not so. great. And he's, he said he was dealing with back spasms yesterday. He shanked the one on 18 to go even. Right. So it just it hasn't been a great two days for him. Hasn't been a great two days. And again, we've seen this from Tiger. I'm not saying that he's, he's, he's jaking it here, that he's pretending that he's sick when he's actually not. But So I'm in the golf cart and said, all right, Tiger, we'll see you next time through. <laughs> Hour number three coming up next. Novo Brazil Brewing is a proud supporter of the Mesa Foundation.
760, America's finest sports station. This update is presented by Jackson Hewitt. It matters who does your taxes. Xander Bogertz and Hassan Kim are going to swap places in the middle infield. Hassan Kim back to short. Xander over to second. Aztec Hoops returns tonight. Big home game against New Mexico. 7 o'clock is the game time. 6, six o'clock is your pregame. All the coverage right here on San Diego Sports 760. Why are people saying hoo to Jackson Hewitt? When you switch to Jackson Hewitt, they'll beat what you paid last year on tax prep. Even if you filed online, proof of prior year payment is required when filing. New clients only at participating locations through April 7th. Terms at JacksonHewitt.com. All right, hour number three, San Diego Sports 760. Coming up, pair cha- uh, pair of tic- uh, four pack of tickets to the Symbiotica San Diego Open at the Barnes Tennis Center. We'll get to your text here momentarily. Xander Bogarts is the main character of Padre Spring Training today. Mike Schilt, when asked a question from Kevin AC about Xander Bogarts and where he is going to play upcoming this season, let everybody know the plan was Xander Bogarts is going to go to second. Hassan Kim is going to play short. Xander Bogarts spoke about this a little while ago, and he was just asked for his overall reaction to the decision and the conversation of which he was a part in Aruba about making a move from the left side of the infield to the right.
All right. So listen, we're going to jump in here because you know, we have some some weird behind the scenes stuff that it's not streaming for the iHeart app, which is part of the complication of adding in a bunch of different feeds. But so we want to make sure we know we have a significant amount of streamers here. And if you were not hearing that, it uh, it's on us. It's not on you. That's on us. So our bad. But that was Xander Bogarts essentially saying that you know he has a ton of respect for Hassan Kim. He's won a uh, World Series at third base. He's won a World Series at shortstop. So why not try to win one at second base? I didn't draw the same conclusion that others have drawn, which is that he is uh, unhappy. I, I don't think that it would have been his his preference. I think he's making that clear, and I appreciate his honesty. I don't have any issue with his honesty whatsoever. Saying like, yeah, it it, it happened a little quicker than I would have thought. But if this is the way the organization feels, he said he was at peace. He said if he wasn't at peace with it, he would have let them know. So I, I don't know how much of a fight this was. I don't know if this was a debate. But I, I found myself listening to Xander Bogarts, and I know he can be a bit direct. And he is uh, a bit blunt when it comes to, to certain things, how he says certain things. Other guys, I suppose probably have had a little bit more media training and they've been trained to say nothing that you ever remember at all. But from listening to him just in this session a little bit earlier today, and again, I know the streamers couldn't listen to it if you were on the iHeart app. I I don't draw the conclusion that. It, it, it's sort of like, oh, I guess this day had to come. I didn't think it was going to be today, but I'm at peace with it and I'm ready to move on. And I'm losing shortstop for a guy who's great. He said that I really, really respect him, especially defensively, which you know, again, you can, you can turn and twist, but uh, he said, I, I have respect. I'm looking at the positives. I had a great conversation with Mike Schilt. I had a sense that it was coming. <laughs> it's not like I thought Mike was coming all the way to Aruba just to, to go hang around the beach for a day. Wasn't the first time I heard it. So I, I think that Xander Bogarts, I, I don't know that I would have, yeah, you, know, you could be very bland and boring and forgettable, and that's the way a lot of players are wired in this clubhouse and, and outside of this clubhouse and another sport. But I, I'm okay with a guy being like, yeah, I, I'm going to have to get used to this. Talked a little bit about what it's like learning how to play second base, et cetera. So all in all, I, I, I don't have any – I'm not I'm not aligned with Jim, Jim Russell, who thinks that, J, that Xander sounded – unpleased not pleased I, I i don't know that i i heard that no i didn't see it maybe his body language suggested something but i'm just listening to it marty you were there i don't know if, mm -hmm. if his body language suggested that he was unhappy with it but listen i remember a time not that this is a great apples to apples comparison where we were in a different day part and we were told for the betterment of the radio station we had to move day parts and we weren't happy about it and we made it kind of clear we didn't think it was in the best interest and what you do then is you go well We'll just make the most of the day part that we're given here because we can't control yep. what it is that the station is deciding. And we went on to become the best midday show in San Diego. Completely so agree. Um, what no else question, can you no do? Question. You know, uh, right. You can't do kind of, anything. That's kind of what he said. And Darren, you mentioned that you could not watch the video. I will post that a little bit later on. But um, no, the body language was fine. Um, and I, I, I don't think the word is resignation, but he, it just seems like, listen, he knew it was inevitable. They have a log jam. This is not a perfect roster. This is what made sense. Like you said, he, he wants to win. Um, you're not asking him to move over for an unknown. Maybe, maybe it's different if, hey, we want you to move over for Jackson Merrill. Imagine if that were the conversation. We want you to move over for, a, for ha Sun Kim, who has been great there. This just makes the team that much better. I, don't, I didn't get the sense that it bugged him. You know, I think he mentioned that, you know, having Mike Schultz fly out, meet him in person and have that conversation. That was a meaningful thing. And he said, I'm not sure if you played this clip. He said, you know, we I made it. He said he decided within 15 seconds, I'm going to do it. It was going to happen anyways. But today was like the first day, like, all right, let's go. Let's go ahead and embrace it, move forward. And today, you know, I, I, I was watching footage of the new infield of, you know, of um, Bogart at second base, Kim at shortstop, and they were they were having a good old time, and they were they hugged afterwards. It was a cool thing to go ahead and see. So I don't think this is going to be something that's going to linger and bother anybody, especially Bogarts, um, moving forward. 
Right. I mean, listen, it wasn't that long ago that we were having similar conversations about Fernando Tatis Jr. being moved out of the infield and moved into the outfield. And then mm -hmm. a similar conversation popped up even this spring training about whether or not he should or shouldn't be playing right. Yeah. And he sort of made it kind of sound like, hey, I don't want to move. I want to stay in right. I think it's better for me and my skill set. And, and I don't know that everybody would agree with this in the organization that it's trickier playing right field at Peco Park than it is a playing center field at Peco Park. But that is what Fernando Tatis Jr. volunteered. So, you know, it wasn't that long ago we were having a conversation about Tatis who didn't hide any of it. No. <laughs> He's like, I'm a shortstop. No. Yeah. And when he won the Silver Slugger at shortstop a bunch of years ago, remember he posted on social media. He's like, yep. shortstop. You see over what it and says? Over. Shortstop. Over and over. I mean, he, he, he I remember I remember him giving that interview to, I think it was Marley Rivera at the time of ESPN. Like, this is who I am. This is my identity. Uh, that's where I want to go ahead and play. And then we then we kept, remember we were all the time we spent evaluating his body language in the outfield. Like, he looked depressed in the outfield. So, no, if we, if we start seeing, Dan, I will study Bogarts's in his his body language now when, when it's game time but he he does it the right way i think I by think the way and, and there was also really really valid reasons that you would think again you know not to to go back in this uh, to, to to go back to the conversation because as i know i ended up in the middle of it that you know there were people in the organization who's like this guy projects better as an outfielder he just projects better as an outfielder than he does as an infielder and you sure. can go over errors and you could talk a little bit about other things and and injuries but like there were really, really valid reasons. Sander Bogarts played really well. Like, you know, he's not a gold glove winner at short, but he he was not a bum at shortstop last year. You know, when you look, you kind of go, man, Xander was up. He had a better season than I remember. Hmm. And you can say a bunch of those numbers came in late or, or however you want to spin. He had a better season than than I think most people might realize when you look at it. But he wasn't bad at short. He really was not bad at short. And I think it would be natural for somebody who's played that position, who was told he was going to play that position in this organization to start to go, well, why? Like, you know, this is, this is sort of what the selling point was. And, and, you know, I know the answer for a lot of people is my dude, you're making $280 million. Just, you know, just do what you think is in the best interest of the yeah. team. Okay. Like, mm -hmm. I, I know that's a real easy thing to say, but these guys didn't get where they got in life because they, they don't have egos because they don't have pride because they don't think that they can, they can still perform. Xander Bogarts, I am 100% convinced, he is convinced that he could still be an everyday starting shortstop in Major League Baseball. And on a lot of teams, he would be the starting shortstop yep. for a lot of these other rosters. This roster, however, has Hassan Kim on it, and that's what changes the calculus for the organization. So I, I don't know how he could have handled that much better, quite honestly, than, than how it was that I heard it. But again, other people see different things. Sometimes I see things that other people don't see, so... I suppose we all have our different viewpoints, and that's what makes the world go round. So, I completely agree. Uh, and there, I'm real quick. I'm, I'm not sure if you addressed this when you when you first to start the show when you got into the whole Bogarts thing. Do you think this means anything or nothing when it comes to Hassan Kim's future? Because do you make a move like this? Do you go to Aruba and say, "Listen, we need you to go ahead and do this." Hey, there's a can't, which, there's a chance we might trade him, but after the Korea series. But for right now, we need you to go ahead and dedicate yourself full time to being a to being an everyday second baseman. Like, what does it mean for the bigger picture? Well, Dennis, I, I defer to Dennis. Dennis doesn't think it completely shuts the door on mm. any sort of potential Hassan Kim trade. But I think you know now it it just, I think it was unlikely yesterday, and I think it's more unlikely today. Mm -hmm. But you know, mm -hmm. after the Korea series, Dennis had that really interesting note about you. You can't. We're we're not even sure what his trade value is because you're not sure if you're going to get a qualifying offer. Now, this might increase his trade value if he goes and wins another Gold Glove at that position, playing mm -hmm. shortstop in the big leagues. This might increase his value. This could increase his trade. Like this could increase a lot of things. You know, this does slightly change the dynamic for Ha Sung Kim as a potential free agent or as a candidate for a contract extension, doesn't it? I think it does. So, you know, I, I you know, as, as Dennis eloquently said, it's AJ Preller, so who knows? Who really knows? <laughs> but, you know, like, there are some layers to it. You know, like, is this an example of some of the stuff that Joe Musgrove continues to carry on about with his, you know, check egos and all that right. sort of stuff? You right. know, I, I mean, I can promise you this. If it got out that Xander Bogarts was adamant that he not be moved from short, and he got up there and was like, no, I'm not happy about this. I'm a yep. shortstop. I signed to be a shortstop, blah, blah, blah. I'm not the boss. Um, you know, we would go right back into where we were at the end of 2023 and how we started 2024, which is some of the, I don't know that it's cryptic per se, 
But, you know, it's not a complete thought from Joe Musgrove talking about dudes checking their egos, which, again, seems to suggest that this is this is about people who are still here in the organization, not just people who are no longer here, who seemingly end up in the crosshairs of a lot of people who just want to blame those who aren't still around the organization. Yeah. So maybe this is a step in that direction. Maybe this is something Xander Bogarts has to do to show everybody else is one of the highest paid players on the team. I'm willing to do something that, that I don't necessarily want to do, but I'm willing to do it because this is what the organization thinks is in the best interest of the club. You know, I, I, I can appreciate that because again, there's no, he could play shortstop, <laughs> you know, the man played shortstop pretty well last year. He was pretty good. And, you know, nobody would tell you that he had a bad year there. Nobody. So, you know, I, I, I do. I, I think what Mike Schultz said a little bit earlier about this being a, a completely selfless act from Xander Bogarts, even if, if it took a little bit of arm twisting, took a little bit of convincing. I'm mm-hmm. sure Bogarts probably sat there and was like, are you sure? Are you sure? But I also like what, what Bogart said. Hey, how many second basemen batting fourth in this league too? Mm-hmm. How many second basemen are, are capable of putting <laughs> up 25 bombs in this league? Right? Like him, uh, Mookie Betts, right? Not, not a lot. Not a lot. Easier, Two of them have your path in this division. Yeah, easier path to the All Star game. I'm watching Hassan Kim do his presser now. Wow. Yeah, I mean, and it's something I think I talked about with Daniel Jeremiah the other day. I don't know if you were here or not, but you know, like like the positional versatility, and in basketball, you know, you play all these different positions, and in baseball, you play infield, you play outfield, you do all these other things. Soccer, you know, the total football stuff. You can mm-hmm. be a forward one day, you can be a striker, you can be a midfielder, you can be a right back. You know, I, I think Xander has a little bit of old school to him, like a Manny Machado, where he's like, no, like, I'm really good at doing this. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, I could probably prove myself in other places, but mm-hmm. I'm really, really good at doing this. And, and I kind of like that philosophy, you know, that I feel like we, we've we lost a little bit of that. But, you know, it's just the way sports operate in 2024 and beyond. So it is what it is. All right. Let's give away a four pack of tickets to the Symbiotica San Diego Open at the Barnes Tennis Center. It's coming up on February 24th through March 3rd. Tickets and info at WTASDopen.com. We started the show with Michael King a little bit earlier today. Uh, We got into, let's see, give me a good question from earlier in the day, Jay Riff. Uh, How did Higgy describe Michael King on the mound versus how he is in person, like on a casual level? Okay. And you have an answer in mind at 877-767-4760? Yep. All right. Uh, how how did he use the very specific word? Are you saying it was canine related? <laughs> yeah, it was canine related. It was canine related. Well put. It's a very, very common term for... That's not a giveaway. Michael King, I'm sitting listening going, this is one of the nicest human beings. He smiled throughout the interview. If you weren't watching on the stream, I'm like, oh. there's got to be a switch that this guy flips on game day. He's also like incredibly handsome. Like Is that right? Twelve out of ten on looks for sure. Wow, well, you seen him without a hat. No, he's good. Good head of hair. I did see him without the hat, and I'll tell you this, Darren, extraordinarily punctual. I I arranged this interview with him this morning, like at I don't know eight thirty in the morning. I said, this is what time the show starts. He's like, okay, I finish this this time. I will be there on time at you know one o'clock Arizona time. He comes out two minutes early. He's like, did I am I on time? I'm like, dude. Yes, you're amazing. Punk- punctuality is a virtue. Dennis, Dennis also very interesting talking about how he thinks the Padres might add to the roster. Now, this was an interesting take. Mm-hmm. David Sampson, who's the former president for the Miami Marlins, for the Miami Marlins, Florida Marlins. Mm-hmm. What are they these days? Uh, Miami. Miami. Okay. For the Miami Marlins, this was him a couple of months back. I thought this was interesting since we're all sitting around going, what's the deal with Cody Bellinger? What's the deal with Blake Snell? Here is former Marlins president David Sampson, something that he said back in December.
All right, rate that take, J-Riff. Should you put a deadline, whether it's December or whether it's January, maybe I would flex it out a little bit longer, maybe get it into the middle of January. Should you put a deadline on when free agents can sign? Otherwise, if you're not signed, you got to wait till the start of the season. Uh, I th- I like the idea of it. I just don't know. Like, you really need to have a, a juicy free agent class every single year to not be overshadowed by the NFL on week 14 or the NBA in-season tournament or college football for that matter, which wasn't even mentioned here in this take. So I, <laughs> I, I, I delivery was funny. I appreciated that. That was like an eight out of 10. Yeah. Plus he's sort of just like doing his own edits on the fly. Yeah. Right? It, it's very, and I like to see like the natural ingenuity of a person like unedited. Like that's, that's very relatable. And this isn't just a take. There's a lot of bad takes out there. He said when he was president of the Marlins, this is something he presented to major league baseball and the union. I understand why the union would say that's ridiculous. Free agency is a naturally evolving thing. Marty rate that take. Should there be a deadline on some of these free agent signings? And if you're not signed by a certain date, winter meetings, mid January, if you're not signed by a certain date and you know, then everybody's mm-hmm. got to get through spring training. Maybe there's a couple of injuries that, that could change the demand. What do you think? Good take, bad take. Okay. John, here's a problem. I couldn't hear that take. <laughs> oh, okay. Cause I had well, to like say, well, I, the same, I put the link in the chat and you kept deleting it. Okay. I didn't know if I was getting hacked. No, it was... you were, no, I didn't know. I didn't know. I thought I was getting hacked because um, it said Marty Tom TV, man. Wait a second. I'm yeah, not, that I'm was not me. All well, right, well, let's know, let's ignore this. Here's the okay. take. You okay. should have a deadline for free agent signings. And if you're not no. signed by the deadline, you can't sign until a couple of weeks into the regular season. I don't I don't like it. And his whole point was this like is it. dreadful. This doesn't do anything yeah. for the excitement of Major League Baseball's right. offseason. Well, you know, well, then if the, if you're gonna have that deadline, then they have the deadline done by what January 15th. Because I'm just thinking, I know what I know what Manny and Harper said a couple of years ago that those guys being signed when spring training had started it was it was bad for baseball. You're talking premier free agents, but I don't know. I mean, who are the who are the, who are the top big buzz guys left? Right, well, Snell, Bellinger, Snell. Bellinger, and Snell, Chapman, and that's kind of it. So yeah, I mean, those are pretty deadline, big names. Those are huge names, but if you're gonna do like a deadline, then I would do it December 20th. <laughs> Well, I would do it. by the end of the winter meetings, I would extend that to January, like mid-January. I, I think, think it's it a good to... idea. And like you said, we're being overshadowed by the NBA in-season tournament. We're being That's overshadowed true. by college football. We're being overshadowed by the NFL. What yeah. if you put everybody and said, like, you have got to sign. Like, you, you know, you probably would have a lot of teams going out there and signing players. I just don't think anybody will ever agree to it. But I like mm. the take. I give it okay. a, I give it an 8 out of 10. I agree. Eight. I'm going to give it a B. Okay, well, let's go baseball. I kick it into a gear here, I think is the point. Like, let's just kick this into a gear because, like, you know, it's just, oh, uh, randomly, know, here's know, Josh Hader. And uh, randomly, uh, here. All right, back after this. Are you paying too much for term life insurance? There's a tremendous price war in term life. Industry rates have dropped dramatically in the past few years. For example, a man aged 45, non-smoker, can get a million dollars of coverage for $75 per month, level rate for 10 years. Or a man aged 50, non-smoker, can obtain $500,000 of coverage for a monthly premium of $110, level rate for 20 years. That's right, guaranteed level rate for 20 years. If you're a smoker, we have great rates available for you as well. At Term Busters, we specialize in policies of $500,000 and above. If you're looking for new or replacement term life insurance, call for a free quote today, 800-200-2250. That's 800-200-2250. 
Don't wait. Call 800-200-2250. 800-200-2250. Sample rate quotes based on preferred non-smoker rate class. Exam required to qualify. Novo Brazil Restaurant in Mission Valley is now open with 60 taps and amazing Brazilian-inspired food. What does it take to take on Alzheimer's? Courage to learn the facts and know the signs, and confidence. San Diego Sports. Now. This update is presented by Jackson Hewitt. It matters who does your taxes. Aztecs back in action tonight. They host New Mexico in a pivotal game in the Mountain West. Free game coverage at 6. Tip off at 7. All the action right here. San Diego Sports 760. Xander Bogarts and Hassan Kim are swapping middle infield positions. HSK to short. 
and Bogey to second. And Caitlin Clark last night becomes the all-time leading scorer in NCAA women's basketball history. Why are people saying hoo to Jackson Hewitt when you switch to Jackson Hewitt? They will beat what you paid for last year on tax prep, even if you filed online. Proof of prior year payment required when filing new clients only at participating locations through April 7th. Terms at jacksonhewitt.com. I really do want to play more Mike Schilt and just count how many times he uses a nickname. I heard Kimmy today, Bogey today, Ace. We've got a nickname for Ace, Ace Man, Kevin Acey. We'll have to do that sometime next week. We'll have plenty more media sessions with Mike Schilt, I'm sure, over the span of spring training. All right, why don't we jump into some texts? All right. Sorry. Seven one four. Oh my goodness! The Padres' best shortstop is going to play shortstop. Well, where do you see Jackson Merrill? Eight five eight. I love the move to second for Xander. Automatically top five offensive second baseman. Take some wear and tear off his body props to Shilton Bogarts for doing what's best for the team. Uh, read this already. This is a terrible move. Hustling it short is great. Cronenworth above average. Don't understand the Bogarts deal. Yeah. Well, I think that's what hovers over the franchise is like, it still doesn't make a ton of sense. Like the guy all you want. And I do. I just don't understand the thought process there. 609, hi, I love the move to sign Kim to a long-term contract. This at least settles all the positions. No more trade drama for Kim. Go Padres, love the show as usual. That from Jason. I suspect this isn't the last that we'll hear of that. And if Hassan Kim were to leave in free agency at the end of 2024, we'll probably start talking about Jackson Merrill as a shortstop. 360, it seems like, oh, I read this one earlier. I mean, it's weird that you guys hear like defensiveness just because I point out what is so obvious that that history is being rewritten based on some of the things that went on around here. Uh, you know, it's not defensiveness at all. You guys think I stumped for Bob Melvin, like as if I had more than two conversations ever with Bob Melvin. Couldn't care less about Bob. But the idea now that, oh, man, there was so much tension in this organization and you had to get rid of Bob. You had to get rid of Bob or you had to get rid of somebody. We've been down the alignment road before, boys and girls. Didn't work with Jace Tingler. Just be honest. 760, is Marty going to break the first Eric Katsenda soundbite? Is he the real Bruce Wayne? I don't know. 415, haven't worked. I wouldn't ask anything. Having work game ops for a high A team here in Portland. If you look at the young guys, they're almost all shortstops playing every other position besides the catchers. The entire Padre infield and right field are shortstops. Yeah, you got a shortstop and right. I think you're going to have a shortstop playing left. You got a shortstop playing shortstop. You got a shortstop playing second. You got a, a guy who can play some shortstop playing first. And you have a former shortstop who's your third base. I think Mike Schultz said you can't have enough shortstops on your roster. 858, sounds to me like AC was spoon-fed the question about Xander with the UT likely heading towards oblivion. Maybe he's preparing to join the Padres PR department. Wow. 609, Kevin AC's nose has a great tan. 609, you sound bitter, Darren. Not bitter at all. I mean, you could just sort of see things that are kind of obvious, right? I guess not. I guess ignorance is, is truly bliss. 609, I can't wait for games to start so we can stop rehashing what a disaster 2023 was yeah it surprises me that there's volunteer there there's there's voluntary commentary from players voluntary commentary that players are volunteering some of this commentary i don't think they're being asked about it it, it stood out to me but i guess this has been a weight on their shoulders three three four bowmel was toxic because he created a barrier with the dominicanos on the team <laughs> he spoke fast he made them Wow. He made them faces. He lost them in spring training 2022. My source interviewed for the Padre gig 
spoke with the team leaders. Did That's Bob lose the Dominicans on the team? Does Jorge uh, is Soler Dominican? I don't even know. Well, that's that's odd. <laughs> Nine one three. That Caitlin Clark moment, absolutely incredible. It was special. She has her own galaxy of greatness. I'm proud of our Iowa girl. Seven six zero. So refreshing to hear some radio guys actually constructively criticize the Aztec basketball team. <clears throat> <laughs> I don't, I, I don't, when did we, did we even do that here today? I thought we were just giving analysis. I'm telling you though, I read that piece about Jalen House. I was like, man, not going to lie. That's who Michael Parrish, people that have sat courtside will tell you Michael Parrish. Michael Parrish can act a little bit like that too, you know. And there's times when the monk can get a little uh, mouthy too with opponents. So and I like that. I think that's how Michael Parrish has to play. I think he's got to say those sort of things to the to the opposing coach and the opposing bench. He's been heard saying quite a few things down there. I know he, it's always easier to point out the other team's protagonist, but you got one of them here too. Every good team needs an enforcer. Yep. Exactly right. 760. Uh yeah, I don't know that we were were I mean constructively criticize him. I Maybe that was J Ref. Thank you. Though. I think that was a compliment. I'll just move on. 609, can you please teach Marty how to move the mic without making so much noise? I saw you doing it on the live feed, but I didn't hear it. I cannot. Okay. In, 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 you can't. And by the way, in my defense, I may have picked literally the absolute worst possible spot to go ahead and set up shop today because I didn't realize there were going to be so many press conferences, right? And there was more media here than there has been at any single Padre spring training camp I've ever been at. So like right now, Yuki Matsui was speaking, right? When he was speaking, you have you have like tons of Japanese cameras here. And one guy was like standing on the table with his boom mic over me. And so everything's like moving. This has been happening all day, whether it was Bogarts earlier, you Darvish earlier. So it's been like nonstop. This place Marty, is- as great as a defense as that is, I'm pretty sure that Texter was probably talking about like all the other times that you're in studio moving. That the wasn't mic. me. That's not me. Six or nine. If Sander wants to play shortstop so bad, why doesn't he wave his no trade clause and take a pay cut? I, I mean, listen, this is why he was signed. This was part of their negotiation. And by the way, he is playing second base and he just literally said, I'm at peace with this. Mm hmm. Which, uh, again, for a guy that played pretty well last year. Not the wink link. I think wink. he deserves some credit on that. Yeah. Marty, tell Marty to go to Mochilero, Mochilero Kitchen in Peoria. They have some great Mexican food. M-O-C-H-I-L-E-R-O. Or the margaritas. 858. So a day off for the players yesterday. The new coach starting team meetings later so everybody can sleep in. Sounds like a laid back country club style start to spring training. No, exactly what you want to hear from a team coming off the biggest choke job of a season in franchise history. No, Shul actually said he did it for the media. He wants the media to ask better questions, be more refreshed. So that was oh, that, yeah. that's Mike has definitely got yes. all of you eating out of the palm of his hand. There is no doubt about that. And I'm not even saying that that's a bad thing. I'm saying that that is also something different from Melvin. Melvin yeah. didn't give, he didn't care at all. I mean, like the one time I met him, he's like, so what do you want? <laughs> it's a true story. I was like, I don't really have much. I just thought, I would say hello, but he didn't have time for that sort of stuff, which is fine. I mean, uh, you know, manage the team, coach the team. You don't need to talk to me, but you can tell like they are. This is a different approach. Don't think it's not. It's probably who his personality is, but this has been a bit different to Marty's point. There is some truth in that one. No doubt about it. I don't know that it's country club shilt, shilty country club. Uh, if I made that spread might be due to Donovan Dent. He's questionable for the game. He plays for New Mexico. Yeah, he's questionable. He's there. He's their point guard. I mean, he's a prolific score, 15 points per game, high percentage shooting. He got a- injured in, in the Nevada game. Now, it, there are reports that he is a game time decision, but on the game notes for New Mexico, he is listed as a probable starter. So just something to keep in mind. Game time decision. Uh, Tiger does have to stick around. He hosts this tournament, so he, he can't get on the PJ and head home. Thank you to the 619 number for he reminding like us of that. He was like 20 minutes south of there anyways. 334, everything is setting up for Jackson Merrill to be our shortstop in 2025. 619, make the deadline. We just heard that David Sampson bit. Well, almost all of us. Make the deadline the week after the NFL Conference Championship games. Not bad. 858, February 15th should be the MLB trade deadline. I don't know about the deadline. I think the free agent deadline. Free agent deadline. 609, sounds like J-Rib's pants got the tightest for Michael King over Taylor Swift and Emma Stone. 
Anyway, the moral of the story today is you can just tell there are lots of people who just want to blame everybody who's been traded, moved on in free agency, or went to coach and manage the, the team of their childhood. Not as simple as that, but that won't stop people from trying to present it as such. All righty. John and Jim coming up next. Have a good week, Marty.